welcome to The Behavioral View. everyone, would you like to get a CEU for this episode? Listen closely for the announcement of three secret words delivered throughout the episode. Take note of those words and we'll tell you where to go to get your CEU when the show is over. Hi everyone and welcome to the Behavioral View. My name is Shannon Hill. I'm the Editor-in-Chief at Central Reach Institute and I am here today with a few friends starting off with Nissa Van Etten, who is usually here with me. You want to say hi, Nissa? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Nissa Van Etten. I'm the Director of Assessment and Clinical Training here at Central Reach. And I also have Kristen Smith sitting in for Carrie Millico today. Kristen? Hi, I'm Kristen Smith, and I am a Senior Instructional Designer here at Central Reach. And our very special guest is Steve Ward. Steve, you want to give a little intro? Hi, I'm Steve Ward, Holdsoft Consulting. Thank you guys for having me. Well, thank you so much for coming. And we invited you here today to kind of talk about goal and, and skill selection um, for behavior analysts. And when you and I uh, had our pre-talk, we kind of thought about, I wrote a beautiful sentence. I'm just going to read my sentence. This <laughs> time going to walk through developing critical skills and learners, beginning with understanding human development and all the way through self-determination and agency. How's that? Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we'll start at the beginning and, and end at the end. That sounds Absolutely. perfect. Yeah, we have a tidy 80 minutes for that. <laughs> <laughs> I love the whole thing. Yeah. Um, we like to kind of start off with a get, getting to know you question, though. So our question of the day that Steve selected, it's such a simple one. It's, um, I wish blank for behavior analysis. Yeah. Um, does everyone want to chime in or is this for me? Oh, that's for all of us, but let's hear from you first. <laughs> um, I wish that we, we keep on developing while maintaining our roots simultaneously, um, remaining conceptually systematic, even as we delve into, uh, I think appropriately delve into some things where some of what we're looking at really is subjective, that we can still be as conceptually systematic as possible in how we're identifying and describing those behavior environment relations. Uh, so we don't lose what's been done uh, and we keep on uh, advancing from it. Yeah. I think that you just said mine a little bit better than what I was going to oh, say. <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. That's I'm the worst. But no, you're the best, actually. <laughs> so, so I was going to say <laughs> to continue to grow, but to do so in a way that um, but serves a wider variety of people in a wider variety of contexts um, without losing who we are and without also um, holding on to things that we don't need to. Nice addition. Yeah, I, like that. <laughs> I had to pull something new, right? <laughs> Nissa, Kristen, what did you guys think for this one? Go ahead, Kristen. Yeah, mine was along the same vein. I really, curiosity, approaching things with curiosity, um, which is something that's been hard for me, right? Like once you learn and become good at your job, it's so hard to stay open to hearing other things. And rather than like approaching them on a defense, like approaching them with a curious, but like also conceptually systematic approach. So I'm fully just jumping on this bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I got to go first. Yeah. <laughs> I think I can sum it up the whole bandwagon in that I think we um, also need to remain humble to our background, to our history, but uh, also remain humble to the socially significant behaviors of stakeholders, you know, of our learners as we work with stakeholders and clients. I think, um, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, but as we move towards working with funding sources like insurance and other organizations that kind of give a little bit of their dictation on what we do, we need to remain humble to who we serve and why we do what we do. Also a very nice ad. Yeah, that's great. All right, so let's launch into the beginnings of us contributing to that then. <laughs> so, Steve, you said it's really important to you that, that we, we start off talking about um, 
human development, basically. Um, what what do you think is important about that or and or missing from behavioral analytic training and preparation? Um, sure. Thank you. Uh, I think without trying to turn it into a lecture series or pretend that I know more about human development than I do, uh, <laughs> without trying to do those things, I think the um, recognizing not just the scope and sequence doesn't get the job done, right? Not like if we're teaching reading, that's sort of a, here's you begin with these elements and you have some sight words and you do that and that's how that goes. But looking at our learners as uh, a three or four year old, a three year old where it should be appropriate to be on our lap sometimes. It should be, we should be going through games like peekaboo and things like that. Um, and that they might have some skills of a one year old while they're in a three year old body and we might see some splintering there in terms of like, it's really appropriate maybe to take on some toilet training, but we're not going to be working on prepositions yet, right? The, those kinds of things. So we're trying to um, recognize more and more, I think, what the foundational, not just skill prerequisites are beneath the skills that we want to try to teach, but also what the foundational repertoires are below the skills we want to teach. Um, just thinking through a few, you know, the, the, the idea of being interested in others. Obviously, I've, you guys know I've been very, very interested in attention as a reinforcer, as something that's one of the many nice outcomes of peekaboo and games like that. I'm, I'm super interested in that. Um, and I've always uh, felt awkward if, if asked to try to teach social things that were out of that sequence. Conversation skills to someone who doesn't care about attention yeah. is a good example. I'm like, I, I can kind of conceptualize it, but I don't see, I feel bad even conceptualizing <laughs> the instruction for conversation skills for someone who doesn't yet want our attention. So I want to go back and work on that. Um, and then, no, you know what, if I do the then, I'm going to get this off on a tangent. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to store the then for later on if it comes, if it becomes relevant. You know, what, what runs through my mind as you're speaking is that something that Kristen's team really is working hard on, which is trying to help behavior analysts understand what are the skills that are underlying the skills and it, it, to move away from using our assessments as a checklist or a guideline for what is next. And this is you too, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So what, what kinds of works are, are you two doing that can rank it? Actually all three, everybody's working in this except me. I'm just like pushing everybody forward <laughs> and say, look at these guys. So how are you guys going about trying to help with that? Well, I know we've got a meeting on the calendar this week, Kristen, to talk about um, starting to conceptualize and do some work on the difference between curricula or curriculum and assessment. Because I think, to your point, Steve, that a lot of behavior analysts, and especially as we're you know moving towards a fast-paced growth in our field, there's this concept that we take the assessments and we teach to the assessment. We teach to the skill that is in the assessment to shade in that box. And truly, um, you know, we know that there are many prerequisite or precursor skills that don't aren't indicated in that box, but having a strong knowledge of what an individual can and cannot do, having a strong knowledge of what builds upon that ultimate skill that we're looking at for requires understanding a scope and sequence and how to build those prerequisite skills. Um, but I think that's, you know, where Chris and I are starting at least beginning that conversation this week. Yeah, I agree. And I think too, you know, there's something to say for when we're thinking about where a human is developmentally, especially when we're talking about young learners, like sitting at the table for three hours, you're going to lose so much rich engagement rather than like playing, mm -hmm. which is what another three-year-old is probably doing at that moment. Um, and then on the flip side, when we're looking at older learners, thinking about all those, those behavioral repertoires that they need like building blocks to get to whatever skill it is we're trying to teach. And if one of those is missing, then that whole structure teeters, right? Um, and yeah, so I fully agree. I think one of the things we're really trying to do in clinical programming and when we're creating curriculum is just making a roadmap so that, because we're not taught that. Like we go to school for years and no one teaches us to how, how to actually design instruction. At least in my school, that was not available way back when there was no electricity. But. Some of our <laughs> <laughs> some of our, our colleagues with, uh, with a more of an education background and, and sometimes the ones with OT and speech backgrounds things like that sometimes are more flexible in yeah. scaffolding the instruction that way than, than some of our behavior analysts are. Uh, one of the things I'll, I will do that is 
not always totally satisfactory to the people on trying to train to do it, <laughs> to supervise to do it, is to you know basically make the point that for a lot of our learners, if what you're doing with them is fun, if they're engaged in it and you're getting like some flexibility, some variety of interactions and those interactions are fun, I almost don't even care what you're working on. <laughs> it's, it almost doesn't even matter. Uh, and at the point you have, you're supposed to be teaching reading. Yes, then I care that you're teaching reading, of course. But but for our guys who are, a lot of them, there is, uh, and this is a lot of the inspiration behind the, the inventory of good learner repertoires. For a lot of our guys, there's such a gap between what they can do and what they will do that we don't have to teach directly on the things that they're not doing yet. Mm-hmm. All we have to do is close the gap between what they can do and what they will do, and they'll already make all those gains. It's just not so... Uh, easily made systematic and replicable if we have RBTs rotating through, uh, you know, too quickly to be trained in, in how to gauge steam and how to be flexible. So you want to kind of take a second and explain what you mean by steam? Oh, yes. Thank you. I forget that. I throw the word around a fair amount. Um, steam is not an acronym. Uh, it is a, it's the metaphor like for the little engine that could. And very easily put, I, I was watching kids engaged in while well, they weren't engaged the teachers were trying to engage them in play and it was awesome that they were trying to engage them in play but it was sort of that as William Doobie put it an imitation of a meaningful behavior right it, it wasn't a meaningful behavior <laughs> it was an imitation it was a kid ultimately complying at some level with the direction to roll the dice um, and it it kind of leapt off the page at me like well this is clearly not the way we want to teach play there's not enough steam uh, enough interest in the learner. And then our teachers sometimes feel compelled to get through the program, right? Like I'm supposed to be teaching, I always use Candyland as my example. I'm supposed to be teaching Candyland now. So we're going to teach Candyland by God. Uh, and and then you end up with them masking the, the absence of motivation for their learners and not having steam. Uh, without being super deep about it, there are some objective things that we can look at, like inter-response time, um, latency, dependence on prompts, the ratio of student responses to teacher responses. If there's like three teacher responses for every student one, we have pretty low steam. Um, but if you have really high steam in, in free flow child led kind of play, you'll end up having like two or three student responses for every teacher response. And that's excellent steam. And what do you advise if there isn't steam? That depends. Uh, one would be, you know, probably don't, don't keep everything exactly as it is uh, if there isn't steam in the moment. Um, I'm trying to decide how much, how, how far down to drill to the landscape versus to be, you know, from a, a couple of thousand feet up. Um, I would say we're going to make a change in the moment. So if I'm free flow play with a kid and we're doing some stuff with the magnets, we're building the magnets and I'm doing my thing. He's completely disinterested in me. He's flipping a magnet up and down just kind of repetitively. So it's not really good leisure. It's not productive leisure wise and it's not productive social wise. And it's not productive for establishing the student teacher relationship. So really low steam. So I'm thinking in my head, is there anything else I can do with the magnets that might be more interesting? Or can we make a transition to something besides the magnet? Um, and then how can I make that transition work as, as seamlessly as possible? I'll stop there for now. So let me break in right now and do secret word number one for our CEU seekers. And that word is checklist. If you need me to spell checklist, it is C-H-E-C-K-L-I-S-T. Okay. No, no, no. It's good. Um, I'm, I'm actually sitting on a few episodes of the behavioral view that are like waiting on um, <laughs> editing and to be pushed out. And one is actually another episode that is focused on behavior technician applications. Um and it's with Kristen <laughs> and Caspero talking about ascent withdrawal and what to do with that. And I, you know, you have made, the, I've heard you make the parallel previously in other talks between ascent and steam. And um, Kristen is publishing in that area too. I'm just curious to hear as you're hearing what Steve is saying, Kristen, how does that parallel what, what you guys are advocating for with ascent withdrawal? Yeah, I mean, I think it parallels somewhat. You know, I think we functionally we want to see is that ascent withdrawal. Um, I think conceptually it it aligns very nicely with this idea of 
we want to find things that are valuable for our learner that they buy into that ultimately meet their goals and move them in the direction that they and their stakeholders are looking toward. Um, and I think like as humans, we all do that, right? Like I want my kids to swim, do swim team so badly. <laughs> so, and they are. Not. And really at the end of the day, what I want is for them to be on a team and learn that dedication and that persistence and like swim doesn't matter. Just like tiles doesn't matter. It could be Candyland. It could be risk. I just want you to have a meaningful social interaction with me and enjoy a leisure activity, right? So I think it's that spirit of finding something that works for you or for the learner, you the learner, um, that you agree to participate in and that you enjoy, right? Especially in the context of leisure activities. I love that. I wish people, I wish more people could do that. Take that, that step back and say, it's not this particular specific thing that is important. It is the, what is the goal? What are we trying to get to? Right. Yeah. yeah. And I love to jump on this example because I, um, having worked with Steve 15 years ago, a lot of, uh, your language, Steve still rings true in my mind as I train others and I work with individuals and one of the things I remember with a client that we shared together was um, this individual, the, the leisure activities were difficult. And I remember always, uh, Steve would always say, go fishing, right? Um, yeah. You have, right now, it's not reinforcing. It's very clear. She's moving away from you. She, the steam has um, decreased. There's no steam there. Go fishing, meaning throw something out there, see if she catches, and then build the steam back out to see if she'll participate with you. And that has resonated with me for the last 15 years and oh, understanding yeah, yeah. that it's the learner is not coming to the activity. We're not interested. It's time to back off and you know go fishing again and look for something else that that learner will um, kind of bite on. So I think that's that. like very nice too when you think of just Shannon because you drew a sentence that it's not a period at the end of the sentence, right? Like it's not like no more leisure. You know, you were you don't you're not interested or you've withdrawn a sense. So like we're done. It's I love that metaphor of go fishing. Like now I can ask more questions. I can dig deeper. I can figure out what it is you're interested in, which is also, I think, since you mentioned it, the inventory of good learner repertoires is so fantastic in terms of the breadth of skills that it looks at that no other assessment looks in that way or no other skill inventory does. Thank you. <laughs> That's but great most, to hear. <laughs> most of those things are are like side, like sidecars, right? Like the VB map. It's oh, like, right. oh, we also have this kind of barriers assessment that's somewhat similar, but yeah, I think it's a very important contribution. Thank you. How did how did that happen, Steve? How did how did the IGLR come into being? I saw a lot of variables. Like uh, I think starting from the point of you know recognizing steam in the absence thereof, or ascent and the withdrawal thereof, or you know without getting deep in in the similarities and differences between the two, it tightens up our feedback loop. Right, that we're not looking at graphs at the end of the week and deciding, oh, you should use a physical prompt right away on this one instead of waiting two seconds for a physical prompt and get the percentage up to 75. Um, our feedback loop is like moment to moment. Uh, and because it's moment to moment, I can see this learner does better with a faster pace of presentation. He's almost definitely going to take items from my hand for a put-in activity if I present it to him. And he's almost definitely not going to take them from the table if they're on the table in front of them. You can like you can work out those probabilities really fast if you're attentive, you know, to steam <laughs> all the time. Um, and, and then with that, you know, our it, it's very easy within I think any discipline. I'll, I'll speak to ours. It's very easy to get into with false dichotomies. Like, is it? Oh, I heard you're supposed to teach at a fast pace. Or no, we have listening processing, auditory processing disorders. We have to teach at a slow pace. Um, you know, things like that. People will come down on one side or the other, errorless teaching versus not errorless teaching. They'll come down on one side or the other. And of course, uh, I, I don't think it's, it's a binary question, yeah. right? I think that errorless teaching is, there's obviously a place and a time for errorless teaching. And I would absolutely advocate it at those times. And then if I saw people overusing it, I would advocate for them to stop <laughs> overusing it. We could, you know, we could dive into what that example of it. But I wanted to, to do the inventory um, to increase the number of variables people were looking at that might be impacting how a learner learns um, so that they didn't just memorize, oh, we're supposed to use this correction procedure because as we see in the, in the uh, readiness section, some kids 
don't learn from correction procedures. Some don't tolerate correction <laughs> procedures. And what we certainly don't need to do is have engage a, a student in a problem behavior episode because they're trying to use a, a correction procedure and, and they're still learning to just even try to respond to our first targeted SDs. So they're really not ready to be corrected for getting it wrong. Great. Do you, um, when you're talking about some of these ways that you're assessing what's going on in that moment, so like IRT and latency, are there guidelines? I mean, or is that all going to be individual? Is it how it feels in the moment? How are you? How do you know if that IRT was too long? Yeah, I'll describe it in, in all the detail that I can. It, it ends up being a feel, and then it ends up being empirical. If uh, if I thought, oh, an IRT, it took, it's say a, a a behavior my student could have been engaging in at, you know, every two seconds he could have been engaging in that behavior, and it's eight or ten seconds. I'm not necessarily worried. I don't want to make up what this behavior is. Let's just use those numbers for now. I'm not necessarily worried at the eight or 10 seconds. I'm watching for the trend after that. So if it's an eight or 10 second IRT and it's something that's meant to be automatically reinforcing, the IRT will shorten if it was automatically reinforcing and then I've got nothing to worry about. If it's if the IRT lengthens instead of shortening and it was meant to be automatically reinforcing, then it must not be. So we're fizzling out where steam is, is you know leaving us here. And it's probably time to think about a transition to another activity or fishing for another activity. Um, and the same could be, I said, I suppose it was a socially mediated consequence. Um, I'll, I'll let the IRT manage itself and I watch the trend. And if it's trending in a good direction, then empirically must be doing well. Yeah, this is why I like you. And this is why this is, this is what gets commented on a lot when I hear people talk about Steve Ward is... Gosh, I mean, he, he's just the smartest guy in the room, but he's also so approachable. <laughs> so easy and doesn't make you feel stupid when you ask a question. That, <laughs> that was a tough question. I really do appreciate your, I think that, that the fact that you are, um, you almost have the brain of a professor, but you have spent your life doing real clinical work. And that, that's a nice hybrid between the two, I think. So I definitely appreciate the IGLR, the things that you've brought to it, um, and, and your clinical ability <laughs> to distill all of this very complex information into user friendliness. Thank you so much. I also, sorry, Nessa, I think I also love to the idea of like looking at these different dimensions of measurement. You, that's the second example where you've, I think, given a different way to think about it. So rather than just thinking about frequency, um, like how often did it happen? Like there are these other dimensions we can measure that can actually give us even more information and better information. Uh, yeah. And I think and that's in, fantastic. In real time. That's, yeah. that's what we really want is to, as much as we can training our frontline teachers, whether they're parents or RVTs or, or whatever, to be able to train them to recognize the, the steam increasing or decreasing and, and make the, the appropriate changes in real time. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll stop that one for here for, for now as well. <laughs> we'll store the rest of that. What's so user friendly about all of it is that we can uh, visualize ourselves in these types of sessions where it's like, okay, let me take a step back. Let me reevaluate. Um, and I think, you know, again, having worked with you, Steve, 15 years ago, when there wasn't digital technology, when we weren't collecting data, you know, on an iPad, when everything was paper, pencil, where it was just like, right now in this moment, step back, what is happening? Reassess this whole situation. And I think, um, you know, with that time that's happened since the last time we worked together, so much has happened where things are more rapid and we've got um, programs where it's like in the program, in your data collection system, do you have the uh, reinforcement schedule? Do you have the appropriate reinforcers where that makes it very manualized? And that's not truly the best way to work with someone who's sitting in front of you. You just right. have to kind of feel the session, uh, you know, look at the IRT, look at the frequency of responding and see if that reinforcer is actually salient or do you need to step back and go fishing? There's so many pieces you can't put into technology that we're doing today. Um, that truly are just the situations happening between a learner and their teacher. Yeah, I love, I absolutely love that. Um, and then the the age old challenge will be how do we, you know, arrange our data keeping systems and and the the, the programming recommendations for our parents and RBTs and teachers. 
how do we arrange those in a way that encourages them to be present in the moment sure. <laughs> with the learner while also still getting the data they need to get and, and using the right prompt at the right time as is, is a program. I just this, just today read a, a friend of mine who's an act person, Amy Morrell. I don't know if you guys know her, um, but she posted on Facebook today the story. I don't know if it's a, a well-known act metaphor that I've just never seen before or if she wrote it. I have to clarify, but the title of it is Be Where Your Feet Are. So wherever your feet are, that's where your mind should be and <laughs> be focusing and be able to flex. I think it's a really hard thing to teach people, especially if they are um, kind of new in their career and they're a little bit nervous about where they are. But one of the things that has been helpful, and I don't want to, these episodes aren't normally like a sales pitch, and I'm not trying to sell the LGLR to anyone, but um, I will say that those matrices that that you provide for the, the easy version and the hard version of this skill has been so helpful for my work in working with teachers and paraprofessionals about conceptualizing. We know that you want to be here. They are here and it's not, you can build, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's been a useful format for people to be able to kind of flesh that out themselves and to think about what's the easier version of this behavior that I'm wanting to see. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Those are the, the dimensions grids. It's another way of trying to look at, uh, you guys have all been here as well. Um, someone says, my kid doesn't listen. And it, like, what does that mean? <laughs> we could all sprain our necks nodding like, oh, I've heard that one. Yeah. I said, well, your kid listens sometimes in, in this way, in these conditions for this long. Um, and then that, that's on some of those things on the easier side, they're already doing it. You want to get over here. Um, but it's, he's not deaf. <laughs> he's not <laughs> deaf. It's not a zero listening repertoire that we're starting off with. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, one of the things then is thinking about, for me personally, I spend a lot of time with older kids. So in terms of helping children grow into um, adolescents and adults that are safe in the world and that are um, as independent as they, and as they care to be, what kinds of critical skills should we be looking at? Yeah. Easy question. Yeah, that's a really easy question. <laughs> <laughs> um, some broad repertoires that we need. Most of the stuff in the perseverance and focus domain of the inventory of good learning repertoires. Can they, uh, from the easiest level, you know, if we weren't going to help them with the puzzle, if it wasn't a joint leisure activity, would they finish the puzzle without getting distracted on the way? And then how many of those skills can become more and more functional? And it's not just, you know, um, doing your laundry doesn't, isn't directly related to safety, which is the question. I, I promise I'm trying to work my way back to the question no, <laughs> where I'm starting my answer. Uh, I think that the, loosely speaking, the attention span to engage in change of behaviors and resist some distraction. If we can get resistance to distraction. One of the things we get from fluency building, uh, you know, when done really well, but also one of the things we can get from, from practice with, uh, with chains, strength, enough strength in chains where there's distractions available. I use the doing the laundry example. Uh, those help us. They help with functional skills. It's one branch of the answer is going to go into, if you can do your laundry and put your clothes away and that stuff, then you're also more likely to be independent in the bathroom. We know that independence in the bathroom is correlated with personal safety and everything in adulthood as well. Um, it also, I think, the, the resisting some of the distractions helps generally with the repertoire of inhibitory control. Uh, that part of executive function that is like, there is something cool across the street. Don't run to it, right? <laughs> it's like, there's something really cool there. You should check if there's any cars coming or if you're with someone or if the lights are in green or some things like that. So I think some of those, some programs that might start off really early as like a wait for permission program. Um, it's not a warm, fuzzy program, but it has a lot of like rich benefits to it that help with uh, the rate of learning how to manage and, and the inhibitory control and controlling our nods and um, conditioning our nods and smiles as reinforcers and all kinds of really cool things. That kind of a little uh, earlier learner program hopefully evolves into 
you know, here's, here's the things, there's boundaries here. And I don't have to be standing there for you to recognize the boundary. Yeah. Right. We want to train it so that the teacher doesn't have to be standing there because there's not someone standing at every door of the house and, yeah. and uh, by roads and all that. So maybe I'll leave it there for now. Secret word number two is excellent. E-X-C-E-L-L-E-N-T. Okay. Well, Missa, I know this is something you're working with AFLs and, and ABLES and, and combinatory skills. Do you have combinatory assessments? Do you have um, thoughts on that? Like, where are we programming early learners in order to be independent later? Yeah. I think that's a hard one because I think, you know, with the assessments that we have, they're they're very different in terms of accounting for these types of behaviors. I think these behaviors, which is why, you, you know, your um, the inventory is so fantastic that it's written in a way where assessing and looking at those behaviors supports other tools in, in teaching and developing skills. Um, but also looking at some of the domains within both the ABLES and the AFLES combined and saying, okay, where would this fit? For this learner, and this goes all, all the way back to that very first question on developmentally appropriate, right? When is it appropriate to teach this type of skill so that we are waiting and transitioning, and you know that there doesn't need to be a mediator at every point, um, but that the learner has developed and the level where okay, a mediator isn't present, but something that acts as a mediator might be appropriate before the mediator or the mediator is faded out, and the uh, the other agent is still present. Um, so I think, yeah, yeah, that's where that combination of all the tools, sorry. So you, yeah, that, no, that's very uh, well put. <laughs> it's important to have a number of assessment tools instead of just one or two to support the learning. Well, I think this is like fully a soapbox thing for me because I think one of the things that our field has a lot of room to grow um, into, or that's not an area of growth that I think would be really beneficial is a lot of times we don't bump into that until all of a sudden we have bigger learners. So now I have like an eight or nine year old and they're going to be out in the community where if I had really looked at these and this is where I just think the inventory of good learner report, and this is where it's outstanding is these are things I can be teaching a three, a four, a five, That's a six right. role. Like That's you don't right. need to be blocked to be at your table. And rather than focus on I'm going to hammer in these matching and these language and these motor imitation skills, which are all really important but they're going to be restrictively taught if I don't first look at teaching you this set of prerequisite. They really are prerequisite skills to learning. And um, I think it's just so important. And they're, like I said, there's no assessment that measures that, right? Like our most commonly used assessments, like the Vineland, we're looking at like answering questions mm -hmm. and, you know, um, those are kind of the areas we focus on. And I think that their teaching would be just so much less restrictive and we their dignity and self-determination would be like incorporated from the start of instruction if we first looked at these prerequisite skills and taught that way well and even know? on those centralized assessments even if they are there they're they're so far down that you're going to hit the ceiling before you ever get to sampling yeah. them to even know if there's there's a problem it, it's it's a little scary to think that you're going to wait, especially in a population that has such high abuse statistics, that you're going to wait until they're 17 years old to make sure that that they know that it's it's OK to say, um, don't touch me there or <laughs> right to, to an adult for any reason. Right. Right. Yeah. OK. Right. You do need that self-advocacy early. Absolutely. Yeah. In addition to a, a whole host of other things. Totally. And then go ahead. Go okay, ahead, Kristen. I'll say the flip side that resilience too, when like you advocate, like I do want to run across the street and I'm like, sorry, you will get hurt if you do. So my answer is no. And then the be able to like tolerate that no. Yeah. Right. Right. So two of the, th that's a sidebar. Um, that's another thing that I do quote Steve a lot on is teaching the, the tolerating no um, programs are just magnificent. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it could be more fun than have a kid walk around the house and, and hear you say no to things that they already really hate. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to switch. Um, it, you and I, we worked together a few years ago and I asked you this, and so I'm interested in the update. Um, is anything missing from the IGLR? Is there going to be a 2.0? Would you add anything if you could? Oh, if you had time. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll take the, the one note for, in part, I think, because I already wrote the companion books with it, mm -hmm. uh, with them, and, and those were not a small task. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
uh, because the companion books are already there, I don't think I'm going to formally update the IGLR. Uh, if I had a couple of things to, to, to uh, add to it, one of them would be um, the manding, our students manding no and our students manding break. I would have it in there. Um, I've, I'll go off on this for another moment or two, if you don't mind. Uh, so <laughs> my preference in terms of our scope and sequence of how we get things going with learners is not to do things that are uh, aversive, scary, you know, <laughs> annoying, and not to do those things early on, rendering the need to man no uh, irrelevant. Uh, my preference is to condition myself as a reinforcer and get some mirrorless teaching and show them the power of words and all those kind of things. And early in my career, as you know, I was a wet behind the ears behavior analyst and I was a, around others who were wet behind the ears. There was, I think, an oversimplification of FBA to DRA, <laughs> uh, right? So something of the function was escape. So we talked the break man and it just yeah. looked so shallow. It looked very, very shallow. A break man was like almost the end of the story. And sometimes the only other part of the story was escape extinction was extra shallow. It's really extra thoughtless. And, and I was very interested in what are all the reasons they would want to not do the thing, right? And that's where I want to be thinking in dimensions grids, like uh, let's help them not dislike this anymore. Let's, let's work around that. Um, so early in my career, I had a bit of distaste in my mouth for break mans and no mans and that. And it, if they would come in and they were appropriate, I was happy to reinforce them. But I didn't want that to be step one in my, in my scope and sequence. I wanted to, you know, watch it as it emerges and then prompt it eventually if it doesn't emerge on its own. Um, but back to the question, if I could now, I would add that to the inventory of good learning repertoires that mending for avoidance and mending for escape. Okay. Well, I think, I think we've been very clear that this is Steve Ward fan club. It is an IGLR oh. fan club. <laughs> and, but one of the things that I think when we talk about what I wish for behavior analysis is this growth and this incorporation and us being able to pilot through some of the hard things that are going on right now. So I think this is a good group to kind of have a little bit of a more difficult conversation because I think, Steve, I do believe in listening to some of the other talks that, or one of the other talks that you've recently had out there yes. talking about the impact of trauma on children with disabilities and specifically, I guess autism is where we're talking about it a lot, but I don't think it should be limited there. Um, and how that changes the way that a behavior analyst should approach the, the clinical decision-making and the interaction with that person. Um, and I know that we've had, a, we've had several people on where we're talking about, is it trauma assumed? Is it trauma aware? Is it trauma informed? Um, yes. And, and a lot of different people are coming to the fore. And I think that there's some divide coming up between particularly maybe people of my age group. And that would include you. Sorry for the gray hair reminder, yes. Steve. But you're with me. <laughs> <laughs> and people coming up now. Um, so I'm just going to lob that out there. So are we really as far apart when we talk about these things as it seems like we are, or is it a language difference I'm trying to work out? I, I'm, I don't know that, uh, I don't know what kind of influence I have anywhere. I'm definitely not a quote unquote influencer, uh, but um, I am trying to make it be just a language thing and not a difference in actual, like what matters to me is what we do. Um, and, and the language matters to the extent that it impacts what we do. Uh, but if you think about, um, so it's so why I don't assume that my kids have been traumatized. I, I can see as they want to avoid some things that they don't like some things. And if I see fear responses and things like that, or they're like, you know, more significant, much more significant fear responses with something that's not going to be painful or, or scary, like clipping a nail, you feel a little percussion there. And that's a little bit off-putting. Um, short of that, that's an understandable discomfort. Um, I, I don't assume, you know, meeting the technical criteria for trauma, but I think that most of the things that I would be wanting to do would be the same as someone who did 
<laughs> assume that there was trauma. Most of those things are still the same in the act, our actual actions. And that is we are respecting the dignity. We're not rushing them into irrelevant target behaviors. We're not, we are accounting for their steam. We're not ignoring it and coercing them through things. Um, you know, we are teaching them self-advocacy and respecting their space. Yeah. So, and then we value them all of, I'm, I'm doing all of those things anyway. And I, I do think that everyone should be automatically doing those things. If, if there's, and if there's anyone we want to help find a different career, it's the people who we can see don't care for their kids. Yeah. <laughs> then they, if, if they don't care for their kids, they shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. So Nissa, I know that you're very active with the compassionate care side of things. What do you think? What do you think is happening in terms of the divide? I think that, you know, we have all these terms that we're using that are, I would say they're new. They're just kind of being highlighted and, and they're terms you can search in search engines or coming out in journal articles. But I think if we truly look at the the why in what we do, I can see that we're the why is that we are respecting those clients, their dignity, what is truly important in terms of targets. And I don't want to go back to my original comment on um, who is dictating the treatment that we provide, but I think it's going all the way back to if we believe a target or a skill is appropriate to teach a learner and we are going to peer review because that target is not appropriate, that we have to stand by our clients and their rights and, you know, going all the way to that um, trauma, you know, dignity, compassion. The ultimate goal is the client's increased independence, quality of life, performance. And if we know that that is the ultimate objective, we're all speaking the same language. We might just have different terms that we're operating under. What do you think, Kristen? Yeah, I think I kind of agree. And I'm going to be totally like the person with the set of having had the opportunity. So Casper and I published a paper on the scent. Um, and we've been like kind of, you know, presenting on it a lot. And we'll actually have a response out by the time this is like live to someone who responded to our paper. I find that a lot of people are actually not in agreement with some of the things that I think are really critical in terms of the process and the things that you said, Steve, like the process of um, looking at STEAM and looking, you know, when a learner withdraws a set, like that's just more information to ask more questions to make a treatment con situation that's acceptable to our learner. It's not the treatment ends and we're done, right? Right. Um, and I find that there is so much pushback on that idea. Uh, and I, this is one of, I guess this could have been my, I hope for behavior analysts, uh, or behavior analysis, but I I want there to be more information on that and more like deeper information so that people can understand like, hey, maybe the reason your learner's withdrawing assent is they've lost steam and you need to go fishing. Or maybe it's because they can't sit at the table for 10 minutes and you need to teach that as an actual behavior, not just as like a tag along thing you're, that's happening while you're teaching a language skill. Um, and so I find that there is this like divide in this place where we don't come with the curiosity to, to be like, hey, so tell me more about what that means. But it's more like, yeah, but then my client won't learn or then I have to go. It, these more restrictive procedures are more effective and quick. Um, and if they just sit through them, then they'll get through it and it'll be OK. Or my real thing that drives me crazy is like comparisons to like catastrophic medical events and that that's the same thing as like what we we're talking about. Right. Um, like we can override a learner's willingness to participate because we do that with like when someone has a heart attack. So I think the things that we're saying are similar in terms of, you know, it promoting that dignity and that resilience and really focusing on those as operant behaviors, not just, you know, things that are happening throughout the session. But I really hope that, um, and I think there's a need for that to more widely spread in our field. This makes me want to say maybe what I should have said for I want wish for behavior analysts for behavior analysis is that we would stay out of the DSM. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, if behavior analysts would do what you guys are describing, which is, is see behavior as behavior and 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 look at the context that's around it, not think of ourselves as treating a disorder in a human being, but to look at that fit between the environment and the child's skills and deficits and whatever else they're bringing to the table. I think we'd be some, I think we would not be as far apart, but because we are continuing to think of behaviors 
and in terms of their origin as not necessarily belonging in behavior analysis, I think that's a problem. Now, there are, which is not to say if there is something that is biologically driven that it has a medical um, rule out necessary that we sh we should be taking it on. I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying that as long as we as behavior analysts, I mean, I think the difference between behaviorism and everything else in psychology is that we don't think of depression as a thing that floats around in your body. We don't think of autism as a thing that floats around in your brain. We are here to look at what is happening between you and the world that is around you. And we can still have an impact even if a person has a diagnosis, which by the way might change the next time that the DSM is revised. That's me on my soapbox. <laughs> yeah. I think too, it's like thinking of what you were saying earlier, Steve, about um, what is developmentally appropriate or I hate that word appropriate. Yeah. Developmentally. So like when I look <laughs> at my three-year-old, he certainly still has tantrums. He is determined. Yeah. He tells me no. He withdraws his lens. He, and then to like expect, you know, he, he'll do that every now, every now and then I'll pretend like that's how often it happens. <laughs> he's, he's flexing, right? Bringing the power of his language and his choice. And, um, so I would expect that if he were in an ABA session, that, that would he would do those same things there because that's he's three and that's what happens yes. or two and a half. And that's what happens when you're two and a half. Um, All right. You do not want to pummel that stuff so, out of them. I don't want to pummel that no. stuff out of them. No. <laughs> it's meant to be there. <laughs> I was like, determination is the hardest thing to teach. I have very determined children. That's what I try and tell myself. Perfect. Hardest thing to teach. You needed to hear that today too, Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> um, what is a constant struggle? <laughs> yeah. I mean, my mom tantrums sometimes. What What do we do with that? <laughs> Who's maintaining that one? <laughs> All right. So I I don't know. I feel like um, there is so much growth that can happen here in terms of, of that. And by the way, like, I don't think you have to feel bad if, if, if you as a listener are sitting here thinking about, I don't know what to do with all of this trauma stuff. And, um, and our final secret word is set S E T set Camille Kolu, who is the, the, uh, as Carrie has deemed her when I brought her up in December, the, the OG of trauma informed behavior analysis I mean, I don't remember if she said it when we recorded or not, but she definitely told me, I do not assume everybody has a trauma background. So I think that part of the reason that that came out, I know the reason that it came about in um, school-based services is the danger of things like corporal punishment. As you say, pummel, I don't want to pummel. <laughs> Things like corporal punishment and um, expulsion being delivered to children who are living in, in very serious situations who maybe they didn't go to war, but they they live in a what is very similar to a war zone on a daily basis and that you won't know that about them. And so you assume that this is present in order to I don't even want to get into things like re-traumatization in order to prevent from making their life worse and more in order to do more damage. Um, you, you assume that everyone has, and if you do, and same thing in adult residential care, we were taught to assume that because it slows down your, your quickness to do things like engage in restraint. Um, and so I think that I would like to see behavior analysis especially those that since the majority of, of you are working with people on the younger end of the spectrum, address that in a non-sarcastic way. You know, what are the risks? They are very real. And, and what do we need to do versus um, how do we, how do we keep from hurting people at the same time? How do we keep from watering down our science and watering down our teaching procedures to the point that they're not useful? Yeah. Would you like me to try to speak to that? <laughs> uh, I like someone yeah. to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that there is one of the things that happens, I, I agree, I, I think, 
two of you, I think, said that, uh, you know, it, it appears that there is a divide on some of these topics and uh, it, it could very easily grow to a bigger divide. I'm hoping that one of the outcomes of this talk is that that will be bridged a little bit. And I have some more talks coming up that I hope will help to bridge that as well. Uh, I think that part of the, you know, I'll just call it like people on both sides at this point, although I don't put myself on either side. <laughs> so I'm just going to, for the, for the sake of convenience of describing it, I'll describe it as the two camps for the time being. Um, I think it's very easy to take the low hanging fruit. Uh, you, you find the examples, as Kristen said, that, oh, a medical procedure, and we do that for that. So we have to, you know, an easy one I did, you know, very sincerely bring up as we talked about safety for adults. It's like there's something cool across the street. Don't run to it right away. You know, that kind of thing. That is important. That's the, the low hanging fruit for people on the camp of you got to get these boundaries in here and we have to, you know, have instructional control. And, and if that means one thing to, to that camp different than it means to another camp, um, that's low hanging fruit. I think it's, it's low hanging fruit on another on the other side um, to to over <laughs> how often people are using escape extinction or physical escape extinction with three-year-olds to teach them to touch shapes. Um, I think that's like, if I like profiled the whole thing, I see that once in a while and I eradicate it with, <laughs> you know, as fast as I can if I ever see it. But I really don't see it often. Um, so I think if we went to more of the nuanced examples, someone's like, uh, I'll, I'll throw an example for that, actually. I'll, I'll, can't, can't conjure a specific kid at this moment, but I'll make up the, the variables a little bit. If we had the choice of, um, you know, we can do these procedures that are, uh, we feel are religiously aligned with compassionate care um, in terms of all the patients and, and self-advocacy first and, and, and all of this. If we can do these procedures that are religiously aligned with that, um, we may get to this point of our student, let's say, engaging in reading curricula with us, which is a meaningful thing we want to get to. We might get there in a month. Um, and if we did these other things, if we made candy contingent upon reading well, and we said this is going to happen before, you know, after this, this is going to happen and we'll, we'll get through it. You know, we're not going to uh, utterly coerce you, but we're going to be a little, we're going to go against the compassionate care recommendations. We're not religious about it here. We're, we're making you deprived of candy on your iPad and now you can only get it if you do this. Um, let's say theoretically that got you to your kids sitting at the table and doing the reading in half the time. And then we, if we had to decide like between those two, which one we would choose at those parameters, I would choose the compassionate care approach to it by a long shot, by a long shot, I would choose the compassionate care approach because I think that's, it's, it's oversimplifying to say our kids sat at the table for five minutes and engaged in primer level reading exercises. Uh, and they weren't crying, right? That's like, that's a shallow description of it. Uh, was our kid eager to be there? <laughs> was he applying himself? Was he looking for the letters to match to the word if that was one of the activities that we had? Was he spontaneously looking for those and directing himself around the array himself to do that? But you're more likely to get there if you are considering what the steam is as you go, uh, I think. So I'm, I'm more than willing to wait twice as long to work twice as long to get to that point because I absolutely believe, one, not only will the skill be more meaningful and our relationship will be more meaningful, but our trajectory, our skills are going to accelerate much more quickly that way as well because we didn't try to, I don't know, coerce attending. <laughs> I think we're staying somewhere, even though at the shallow level, it looks like you got there faster. And I think if we did some other examples on that and we changed some parameters, there'd be some times that I would go the other way. i say, actually, you know what? We're, if you don't mind, I'll take one more minute and give an example like this. Um, and this would be a play, a play example. I have some kids, um, all the time, I have at least one, uh, where we're trying our free flow play, we're trying to join. Um, I've got some pretty skilled people doing it. Sometimes I'm struggling to do it. Sometimes our kid is really territorial, really creates rigid patterns really quickly. Um, and it's really hard to break in. So I'll give that a lot of time. I'll try a lot of different things. I'll, we'll, I'll go weeks, you know, working on that. And then I'm thinking of one kid in particular right now. Um, at some point I might decide, you know, what would be better 
than this is to like to demonstrate if I have something that goes away by itself, like a piece of candy, that I'm the one who has the candy. And then I'll give it to you and you can consume it and you can get more. And there's a little contingency that we begin to build up. And even, um, even beyond that, that I have this little closed ended activity at the table that every so often we're going to, we will get, get control over the bin of items that you're way too territorial over. And we're going to get you to do these things. It's gentle enough, but it also is something that we see through. It's like, nah, th this is going to happen. I'm not wrestling you to do it, but this it's going to happen. And when I've chosen to do that, which hopefully isn't going to make me like race to this intervention, you know, more consistently because it's worked nicely. When I've chosen to do that, I think what we've accomplished is our kid actually relaxes more. Uh, they, oh, okay, here's these things in front of me become SDs because I know in the path they're really easy to interact with. I put it from here to there. It's only like three things. And then all that good stuff that I wanted all comes back. I think that's a clarity that can be contrasted with the ambiguity of my free flow attempts to join in the play. As we're like coming for your dinosaur, I'm not trying to take it from you. I just want to see, can I make it more fun? You think I'm coming for your dinosaur. So you're on edge, you're defensive because you think I'm coming for the dinosaur. That ambiguity is the enemy when we're dealing with anxiety. And if we're thoughtful about how we arrange somewhat, essentially like a discrete trial, um, introduction to discrete trial, if we're really thoughtful about how we introduce that, we can gain the clarity. And then a lot of our kids are calmer because they understand the clarity. But I, I do want to put that in its place and understand why we're doing that. It's not so that we can race through the able skills faster. It's so that we can get them to be more approachable, <laughs> to be more focused and calmer. And is there conversation with the child about this? But in, well, with the Russ particular child, there's not language skills for it to work. I'm narrating these anyways, though my learner understands them. I do think a lot of our mm -hmm. learners understand more than they can demonstrate observably. I think they understand more. Um, that's impeded by some other things like our, what we're doing with our body means more to our kids, to some of our kids than our words mean. Uh, but I don't discount that they know the tone of what I'm talking about. <laughs> they get the, that I'm, I'm speaking in relaxed and natural tones and not using a directive or firm voice or any of this, and I'm saying, I know you got this, that kind of stuff. Um, but he wouldn't have been able to select a shoe from an array at this time if he had really, really wanted to. I still believe many of our kids understand um, big parts of our, uh, our communication. And I still really, really believe that if you've done that front end work, most kids, and there's always going to be exceptions, right? And Cass and Kristen talk about this. Everybody wants to talk about the exception. Um, but, but most kids, if they really, really trust you and they, they, they have pride in what they've gained with you, we'll get to the point where they'll, they'll hand you that dinosaur. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but I want to make sure, Kristen, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think this goes back to what you were saying earlier, Steve, is that we're not just measuring. So I totally agree. And I think that there are, if we don't teach this type of resilience that like sometimes you hand it back to me, I'm sorry, I know you hate it, but you have to, <laughs> you become, it, it becomes problematic later. Yeah. Um, but looking at those different dimensions, like how long did it take until they handed it to me? What did their affect look like? Did they, yes. were they excited when I gave it back and they smiled at me to say like, you gave it to me, you know, like really thinking about other ways that we can evaluate that what we're doing is not provoke like creating more anxiety and is not and that we need to pivot to a different procedure or a different context or situation um and what you and just I, did oh my gosh that is it that is it Kristen that oh my gosh you know showing an empathy towards the child as you do this thing that you know is so hard for them is different from what it was 30 years ago 30 years ago or you know, you're not supposed to be reactive. You, you know, you're not going to give any attention while you do this, blah, blah, blah. So I really think that that's a good tip for just anybody. Just show some empathy while you're going through this. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Steve, did you want to reply to that? I cut you off. Uh, no, no. I, I talked for a really long time just there, just before <laughs> that. So I was trying to open it up. <laughs> well, I think that's what also... IGLR does 
And again, like I'm not selling this. I'm just, I'm a precision. Sigma teacher. Reach I'm, does not own the ideal <laughs> art. <laughs> well, um, like, I think looking at those again, prerequisite. So like I got, I need my learner to practice giving up things that make them anxious or make them show behaviors that might be consistent with anxiety, make them uncomfortable. Yes. What skills do they need to already have in their repertoire before I put instruction in for that? Do they have coping skills? Can they um, help calm themselves down? Can they, do I have that rapport and that uh, relationship with them where they can trust me doing this? And if any of those things are missing, then ultimately, like you said, Steve, when I go in and do it, it's not going to work. It's going to be a catastrophic failure. And then I'll have to go back and do the assessment <laughs> and see what's missing. So, yeah. And, well, and ultimately, if I I'll add one, one little take to that, that, the same as my, my answer about the uh, IRT earlier is it will end up being an empirical thing. If some of the time, you know, the, the first time we had this guy come to the table to put some things in a thing to get his things back, the first time their steam was like a two, right? But then, you know, three times later, it's a three. It's like, oh, okay. Well, then empirically, that, that bottom row, of the, my, my favorite part of, well, Team and Markle was amazing. I have to reread Team and Markle again pretty soon. Uh, the whole how to break down all the different skills and compare them with each other all across the oh. bottom is the emotional learning part. I've always loved that part because that, that, that's our indicator of whether it's going to be getting easier and better from here or whether it's going to be getting harder and worse from here. And then in the end, it was like, oh, was that, you know, I'll go again to my example with the guy who we decided, you know what, let's, let's take a different route to get where we want to go. Let's do closed ended activities and getting his stuff back. Um, is that empirically, right, it got easier. Therefore, the steam must have been good enough for that one. But had it stayed at a two for three days straight, I'd be concerned and I'd have to still be problem solving, still be trying to find something else um, to try instead of that. Well, I think that we are approaching the end here. So I would just like to say, Steve, you've mentioned you have several other talks coming up. Are there, um, I'm not exactly sure. I've kind of lost track of our release schedule. Um, I think <laughs> it will be early fall, probably when this comes out. But just in case I'm wrong, if you guys want to talk about what you're doing over the summer too, we'll, we'll cut and add what's the right pieces. Where can we find more from all of you three? I, I was imagining you were asking me first. Um, at the moment, I can't remember. I, I don't know exactly when they're coming out, but over the next two weeks, I'm having another talk with Dr. Pauly and with David Roth. And uh, we're primarily going to be talking about punishment and trying to you know, find the right way of talking about it. Okay. Um, and then also within the next couple of weeks, I'm having a, a, a four-way conversation with Emily Kearney, um, Nathan, I said, Nathan Dennis, embarrassed it took me a moment to get his last name um uh, and uh penny holloway um and and i'm hoping with them uh, we're starting the process of trying to get into more of the nuance clarifying what i think is some misinterpretation maybe from both sides which might be making the divide bigger um uh, trying to bridge that here's here's what we mean it's it's not a it hopefully it's not a religious set of guidelines that are it's easy to poke holes in a religious set of guidelines mm -hmm. Uh, but we don't want to have something that can have holes poked in it. We want to have flexible common sense guidelines that still lead us to everything we've been talking about today. Okay. Any um, conferences or workshops? And we'll, we'll also drop in your link to your website. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, no, I'm doing some private, some, some school and, and company uh, workshops and things coming up. So, oh, I'm planning to go to FABA this year again for the first time since COVID. Next. So I do plan to be there. Yeah, all right, great. How about you, Nissa, Kristen? Where can we hear more from you or read or see? I will be at ABAI this year. I know this will probably be out way after ABAI. Yeah. Um, I've got uh, small conferences up in the East Coast for uh, a couple different schools using the assessments. I have no idea what's happening in the fall. That's way too far ahead right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a publication coming out that's a follow-up. It's a response to a response on yes. um, Cass and My's Ascent publication. And I'm also really excited. Uh, I hope I told you this, Shannon. Uh, I'm writing uh, something for, it's either going to be a webinar or in the Institute about how to write goals that can be accepted by third-party funders for things like, basically like the IGLR and um, Ascent-based work. Because 
a lot of times we do get pushback or peer review for those. And so um, giving people strategies to be really strategic in how they incorporate those um, and why they're important. And then hmm. conference, I kind of had a early heavy conference here and I'm just not really committing to anything right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will just say that it, whoever you're doing that for will definitely be findable in the Institute. I will guarantee because that is something that, that people will love to see. And I would be very excited to be adding that in. All right. Well, like the rest of you, I have no idea. I'm going to ABAI and I'm not sure what happens after that. So, um, but we are planning NISA <laughs> at ABI yeah. to, to do a behavioral view live. So if you're watching this now, cool. go on back through the archives and or forward through the archives <laughs> and find our behavioral view live, which ought to be available by the time you're watching this. But um, Kristen, Nissa, Steve, thank you guys so much. This has been a fun talk and I think it's been very worthwhile. I appreciate it. I do too. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. And we will see you next time on The Behavioral View. If you would love to give us some feedback, you can email us at thebehavioralview at centralreach.com. Follow us on social, see our institute on Facebook and LinkedIn. Any way you want to get us that feedback, ideas, people you want us to talk to, uh, we're listening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching this episode of The Behavioral View. To get your CEU, follow the link in the instructions below. You can then go to the attendance verification quiz where you'll enter in the secret words and pay the CEU fee to generate your certificate. If you've already done the work, you may as well get the credit.